they bought a house brand new. Yes. Five, four, Who knew three, that? Two, Who knew that? One, um, Palm Love would come up, uh, like University of Palm Love, or like, I know you all know it's Branch Normal and AM and N. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the Branch Normal Collection. Today we're going to be interviewing Kyle the Conductor. I'm excited about this interview. Um, really excited. But let's go ahead and get into our spotlight before we talk to Kyle. Now, our spotlight for today is going to be William Steele. If you watched the uh, most recent Harriet Tubman movie, movie uh, you actually know a little bit about William Steele. He was played by uh, Leslie Odom in the uh, most recent Harriet Tubman movie. Now, there are about three or four Harriet Tubman movie, movies. Um, I like the most recent one. I think my favorite might be the one with Ruby D. Check that one out. I think it was made in the uh, 70s. Uh, but uh, Ruby D plays Ruby D is in Ruby D and uh, Ozzy Davis. Uh, Ruby D plays uh, Harriet Tubman. But let's talk about William Steele. All right. So look at my notes here. William Steele was a conductor. All right. You're gonna hear that word conductor come up a little bit today. Um, William Steele was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Uh, he was the director of a complex network of abolitionists, sympathizers, and safe houses that stretched from Philadelphia to what is now southern Ontario and Canada. Uh, he did this work for about 15 years, from the ages 30 to 45, roughly. His house was a station on the Underground Railroad. Um, his house was at 625 South Delhi Street. Uh, D-E-L-H-I -E Street in South Philadelphia. Um, the house is still standing today, I believe, so you can actually go by and check that out if you're in Philadelphia. Uh, he was born around 1819, 1821, uh, depending on what records you find, uh, in Burlington County, New Jersey, uh, near Medford, New Jersey. All right, so born in New Jersey um, to his parents, Levin Steele and Sidney Steele, now, Levin Steele, his father, had bought his own way out of, out of slavery, but his mother escaped from slavery, all right? In 1844, at the age of 23, William Steele moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Three years later, he married his wife, Letitia George, and they had four children. Now, they lived at 625 South Delhi Street, as I just mentioned, and their home was a station on the Underground Railroad, that means escaped slaves, um, a lot of them stopped by their house as, uh, because it was a station on the Underground Railroad and they were hidden there at the house for about five years, 1950 to 1955. Uh, wow. Um, so they had four children, William Steele and Letitia. They had four children. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the children just because they were doing some remarkable things. Uh, one of the uh, children was Caroline Matilda Steele. She was the first African American. She was one of the first African American women doctors in the United States. So she was one of the first Black women doctors in the U.S. Um, their son William Wilberforce Steele was a prominent African American lawyer. Their son Robert George Steele was a journalist and a print shop owner. Frances Ellen Steele was their daughter. She was an educator who was named after the poet Francis Watkins Harper. Now, if you've ever been to Franny Lou's here in Philadelphia, you may know that Franny Lou's was also named after uh, Francis Watkins Harper as well as Franny Lou Hamer. All right. A few more facts. Um, in 1859, William Steele wrote a letter to the press protesting the racial discrimination that African Americans faced on. Philadelphia streetcars. So this is about 100, 100 years before Rosa Parks. All right. In, 16, in 1867, he published a brief narrative of the struggle for the rights of colored people of Philadelphia in the city railway cars. Now, after eight years of lobbying, the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania legislator passed a law ending segregation of public transportation. All right. 
So we know what we know about Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement, civil rights movement happening in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, in 1955. Uh, some something similar took place almost a hundred years earlier in 1859, with the help of William Steele writing a letter to the press to uh, protest against racism on Philadelphia streetcars. So when we hop on our SEPTA and we don't have any trouble getting on, we can thank William Steele for that here in Philadelphia. Now, William Steele is best known for his self-published book called The Underground Railroad, and it was published in 1872. This is about seven years after slavery ends. Um, in the book, he documented the stories of formerly enslaved African Americans who gained their freedom by escaping on the Underground Railroad. The book included more than 1,000 interviews and was 800 pages long. So that's a lot of interviews. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, William Steele was a big uh, influencer of the Branch Normal Collection, a big influencer of collecting our stories and documenting our stories. Now, he interviewed 1,000 uh, escaped slaves, um, and that book was over 800 pages long. Now, his book contains some of the best evidence we have of the workings of the Underground Railroad, detailing the freedom seekers who used it, including where they came from, how they escaped, and the families they left behind. During his career as an abolitionist and civil rights activist, still acquired considerable personal wealth. So he was a businessman as well. He began purchasing real estate throughout Philadelphia as a young man. Later, he ran a coal business and established a store selling new and used stoves. He also received proceeds from the sales of his book, The Underground Railroad. Um, he organized one of the first YMCAs for black youth. Um, and lastly, he passed away on July 14th, 1902 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So that's William Steele, who was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And now we're gonna to talk to Kyle, the conductor. All right, enjoy. <laughs> we definitely gonna start over. <laughs> right, hold on, hold on, we're gonna start over. <laughs> you ready? Welcome, 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 Kyle, the conductor to the Branch Normal Collection. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, KB, for having me, man. Um... I learned a lot this year, and I, I learned the biggest thing is uh, make sure you come off mute before you start talking on a Zoom call. So. <laughs> no, that's real. Now, when I knew I was interviewing you, I really thought about William Steele had been coming up a lot for me, and I knew I wanted to have it a spotlight for somebody, and I felt like you were the perfect person to have him like be the spotlight for. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I didn't know much about him, man. You just put me on, so I was just, I'm always learning something. This is this is dope. A word. Yeah, I mean, you a teacher, so good teachers are always learning, right? So now, why why the conductor? Why like why did you add the conductor to your name? Um, it's it's, it's layered, man. Uh, so I was I was in uh, Miami for a graduation in December, and when I thought about um, having a privilege to be in a warm place, one have the money to go somewhere to have family members that are graduating, and then to be in a warm place where my family and friends were in a cold place like December, Philly is frigid, right? And I remember listening to this podcast about this. Uh, so as I was there, I was thinking about like the freedom that's in being able to travel and not be like stuck in a position that you don't want to be in. I hate the cold. Like I literally, I'm looking forward to being uh, like living by coastal, right? And um, listening to this podcast, the person was saying, the only person who's going to save you is you. And his name, uh, he changed his name from like Charlie Jablo to Charlie Rocket. And he said, Charlie Rocket was this personality that saved him from himself. It was a superhero he's been waiting on. And I thought about, he said, who's your superhero going to be? And I was sitting there in the sun like, yo, I need to create a life that can get me to Miami or Ghana or uh, Brazil or Hawaii anytime I want to get up and go. And I need, I, need, I need someone to come save me from me. And not to say that Kyle J.R. Morris, which is the name of my, one of my businesses, is not a thing, um, but Kyle the Conductor is someone who, when I transform into Kyle the Conductor, like before I do a speech, before I do an interview, when I'm praying, when I'm asking for energy for my ancestors and everyone, it's um, it's like it's like someone's taking over me. Like I throw this crown on, I throw my hair up, I'm like, all right, get in the mirror a couple of times. So the reason why the name the Conductor specifically, though, 
um, other than just being a superhero for me, is my pop was a conductor. His name was also Kyle uh, on uh, Scepter. So he's funny to my trolley cars with William Still, but my pop was a conductor for the train uh, when I was growing up. So I remember spending time at the front with the engineer to, you know, to be like, to push buttons. They used to let kids go to like the front of planes and stuff, surprisingly. Um, I remember doing that. I remember watching him go back and forth, talking to people, commanding attention, like walking into a trolley, well, walk, walking into a train car saying, all right, tickets out, da, 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 making people laugh and, um, and then also learning about um, science, right? There's enough electricity in your mind and in your heart to power uh, light bulbs and stuff. So mm. I think about the kind of light bulbs that can go off when we use our mind and our heart the right way. And how can we conduct ourselves a certain way so we can conduct energy in a room a certain way and then ultimately conduct our people to freedom. I learned Harriet Tubman called herself a conductor. She referred to Moses as a conductor. So I, I, and learned, now I learned about William Still. I'm like, well, my job is to liberate people, right? If we're, not, if we're not teaching to liberate, what are we doing this for, right? If we're not creating opportunities and jobs and organizations to liberate others, then what are we doing? It doesn't matter if you get free. If you can't take the door off the hinges, then what, what's, what's it about, right? So, um, yeah, conductor in those ways, conductor as a like a physics way and science and all of that, but conductor in like a Harriet Tubman way um, and also like keeping his train on track. You know, I've seen my pop do it. So pay homage to him. And um, and yeah, yeah, be my own that's superhero. That's dope. Yeah, when you mentioned superhero. So um, when I was going from high school to college, I called myself Johnny Williams, right? That was my superhero name, right? And a lot of my friends from college still call me Johnny Williams, right? And so Johnny was my grandfather's first name and Williams was my favorite cousin's last name. And I always liked the way that that sound. I would never let you just say Johnny or like Mr. Williams. You had to say Johnny Williams together with the whole name, right? <laughs> yeah. That's cold, that's cold, yeah. Yeah, so those things are like really powerful. Now you mentioned your father uh, being a conductor on SEPTA. What were your parents, when, you when we talk about your parents, what were their careers and what were their hobbies as well? Word. So, um, well, I'll start with my pop. So he worked for, for SEPTA uh, from like 88 to 05, 04, something like that. And uh, I was born in 1990. So growing up, seeing him on a train, that was a heavy thing. But I also saw that he wasn't um, only working for SEPTA. So I would see him work and he would do the, usually the morning shift. He liked to get his day over with so he could have the rest of his day towards his craft. Um, he was an author. He published six books by 1996. And uh, his first one was um, was the mentality of man. And I remember helping him at Kinko's, which is, yeah, Kinko still exists, helping him like staple his books together. Like, he would print them like chat books and like poetry, books of poetry. And he would print them and all of that. And I would help him sell them at open mics. And um, he would host open mics and he would host concerts and celebration of black writing. I got to meet Nikki Giovanni when I was a young boy. Sit at mm. the dinner table at Hula Hands with Sonia Sanchez and the last poets. Like just all these experiences I, I took for granted in the nineties. Cause I just wanted to spend my weekends doing cool kid stuff. Like I didn't, who are all these old people that smell like shea butter and incense? Like, I don't want to <laughs> be, I don't, this is, I don't want this. Like, you know, right. but I'm so happy to have that experience. So seeing him host, seeing him be a poet, seeing him lead a room, command attention. Um, and then also have a day job mm -hmm. showed me that. And then my mom, uh, my mom's hobbies were helping people. So my house was always that stop on the Underground Railroad as families and cousins and aunties and whoever stayed for my mom give anybody six months. And um, and I remember once she got her home, like because so I was I, I lived with my mom for a minute and then I moved in with my pop because I was sharing a room with my grandma. I was me and my grandma in one room, my mom and my sister in another room. And then I moved in with my pop and I moved back. I moved into the living room. My grandma still had her room. Uh, my sister kind of was in both rooms because she was a little older at this point. It was just a lot in this little apartment. So once my mom got the space, that back room was always, someone was always living in that back room. Someone was always living with us in the basement or whatever, especially when I went to college. So my mom's hobby is helping people. And um, her day job, she worked for an insurance company, still do, for, it's been 33 years, 34 years now. So, um, so yeah, that's my parents do. Or now, what were your hobbies uh, when you were younger? Um, and did you play any instruments or any sports as well? <laughs> uh, I quit a lot of stuff. Anything that I had <laughs> that I did, it seemed cool when I tried it. I'm I mean, like, you started a lot of stuff too. I started. Know. I started a lot of stuff. I started a whole lot of stuff. I started football. I started basketball. I started karate. I started acting classes. I started. Um, piano classes I started French classes I started everything everything that my parents 
wanted me to do everything that I thought I wanted to do because it seemed cool. I saw the blitz and glam, but I didn't have the, the guts to, to get to the glory. I found myself, uh, you know, trial and error. I'm, I'm glad, I'm sure it was expensive looking back. I remember football was $90. And they were like, no, what, what's been 90? You can't even keep the helmet. You can't even da, 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 da. And I, I'm like, I mean, yeah, but can I play? I never actually played, never lost enough weight to play like in the, uh, in the league. And I could have lost, I was, I was like four pounds over five pounds. I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to sweat. I didn't want to get hit. Cause I was 12 playing with older kids cause they were bigger, but I was heavier. So I had to play with an older weight class. And, um, and yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't hit puberty yet. Like I'm just, I was just wanted to be out there. So um, yeah, I didn't really have hobbies. I think honest, I like to draw. I started writing poetry when I was five. I performed on my first open mic when I was five. It was October gallery. I think it was on like second street at the time. Um, but yeah, I just like to. Oh, when you were five, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, my it was, my pop was hosting it. He put me on a list. He said that poem. I wrote it at Hula Hands when I met um, uh, oh, some brother. Oh. No, no. This was at uh, we were at Hula Hands a lot. So right. I learned I like to eat out because I spent every weekend with my pop eating out. It was always mm -hmm. easy. so Hula Hands because they had chicken tenders. This time was a brother. Um, oh man, it was the Twin Poets. It was the Twin Poets right. from Wilmington. And uh, we were all there. And there was another brother from, um, he was in the slam. He has, a, I see his face, Eric something, I don't know. But um, but yeah, I remember writing a poem there. I shared it with them. They said, cool, you got to do it. My dad had an open mic. I saw the gallery. Uh, I, I performed it. I was like, my dad is like a sponge. It's hard when he's dry, but wet when he's soft or something. Somebody's sponge. My dad remembers it okay. to this day, <laughs> but, but I don't. Um, I started writing raps at five too. So I like to just write and perform. Anytime I can get in front of a crowd. Really, that's all it came down to. Give me in front of a crowd. Right. Yeah, I've seen you in front of crowds like so many times. Like you're very, you're one of the most comfortable people I've ever seen in front of a crowd. And you never, you never feel uncomfortable. It can be like emergency situation, and you're good. Right? Y'all think I'm good. I'm, and I think that's so. I, uh, I'm doing an eighth grade commencement speech in a little bit after this. We talked about, right. and in my speech, I talk about. I'm nervous before every time I speak in front of people. I don't care if it's a one-on-one -on -one or a Zoom call. I know other people want to see it. Or even like in those rooms where like it's like a men's group or something. It's a circle and, and everyone's gone. And you know what the question is. You know what your name is. You know how you're about to introduce yourself. It's my turn to speak. My stomach drops to my big toe. And I just get nervous every time. But I do it afraid. But I'm always afraid before I hit the stage. And when I stop being afraid, like when I would host a certain open mic or I would do whatever, I'm like, I'm not into it anymore. Like I don't. I don't need to be doing this. I don't, I'm not passionate. Like I'm not getting afraid anymore. I don't care. Right. So, no, but yeah, so, but, but thank you for that. I received that, but I want you to know behind the scenes, I'm, I'm pooping my pants. No, that's real. When you lose that passion, like when you lose that passion or nervousness for something, that's a sign for sure. Now, what was, um, what was your first job you ever had? What was the first job you ever had? Oh, bad. I work, uh, well, my first my first job was working for my grandma. I would clean up, me and my homie Dave would clean up our apartment for $50 each. And that would happen like once a month. I realized she just wanted to give us money and want to keep us busy during the day. Mm -hmm. um, but I count, I count those jobs because I, I've learned that uh, getting money from someone else um, is a job, whether you're selling a wristband, a t-shirt, whatever, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's a hustle or you show up and clock in. My first time clocking in, uh, I worked at a car wash in the Andor Shopping Center in Roxboro, and um, this high and school. This was uh, not this. Well, yeah, yeah. It was I was a freshman, yeah, because I had uh, technically sophomore year because I had got arrested May fifth, two thousand five. I was on probation, and I had got a job October. I got off probation October twentieth. I got this job October fourteenth, uh, two thousand five. I started at the car wash, and I was there for a minute. And I worked at a whole bunch of places in that shopping center, the Staples, the Cold Stone Creamery. I love the Cold Stone Creamery. Cold Stone Creamery, I could make up songs and get tips. What? I was showing off like your boy Young Jock. I was like, you can meet me at the Stone. It's going down. Grab a pint and take it home. It's going down. Like I was having so much fun at Cold Stone, man, remixing songs for tips. Um, but the car wash was my first gig where uh, somebody else had to pay me outside my blood. Or now you don't have to go into detail about this. How old were you when you got arrested? You mentioned I was, I was 14, about to be 15. 14, about to be 15. Okay. Tried as a child because I was uh, 15, 16, and 17. They try you as an adult for weapons on school property. But anything under 15, I was a month, a month and some change away from uh, being tried as an adult. Mm, okay. Now I know you go to Cheney and Lincoln as well. So I want one, one of the big uh, focuses on this um, collection 
is people's path from high school and kind of what happens for the like next four or five years of their life, right? Because we kind of teach it sometimes that like do well in high school, you get into college, you'll do your four years and you'll find a job right after that. Like it's a straight line, but often a lot of stuff happens in those years. So walk us through graduating high school, finishing high school and the next four or five years of your life. Yeah, for sure. So um, my senior year, just to, like, it was a change. I remember going to my mom's church for something she had to stop by. The sanctuary was empty. I went to the balcony. It was a big church on the corner, Germantown and Hunting Park called Triumph Baptist Church, and uh, where I used to go. And I remember getting on my knees and praying and asking God, if you could just, I'm just, I'm just tired of getting in trouble in school. I was always getting suspended. I was getting like losing stuff, privileges and all that. So I'm just, I just want, I just need to change this school year. Please, can I, can I just come before you and just please, like, I'm just tired of it. Like, I was tired of not living up to my potential. And, um, and with that, with that strength, um, I was able to get a 3.8 GPA my first, first semester, first quarter, which I applied to Cheney University on a strength because somebody from school, um, I was number 21 in my class. And the person who was number 20 was sick that day. I forgot his name, but he was out of school that day. So I was able to go on a field trip to the school fair, the uh, college fair at the um, school district building. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't number 21 or if I, which is messed up, then they don't take the top 20 kids, but whatever. Right. Um, I ended up applying with my first quarter at a 3.81 and they ended up giving me the Keystone Scholarship to Cheney University, which was a full ride, book voucher, room and board, snack bar, extra snack bar money. Like they really looked out, laptop, all of that. So when I graduated, I ended up choosing another school. Um, I chose Cheney last minute because I'm like, it's free. Let's just go. I didn't want to go because my dad went. Me and my dad was kind of shaky at the time, um, but I went anyway. And uh, my grandma ended up passing away, and I had a convo with my pop, and he said, "You complained about being too close to your mom, and I just lost mine." And I was like, "You right. You right. Let me go to 45 minutes away because uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to go to Millersville, which is a couple hours away." Okay. And um, I went to Cheney. Best four years of my life. Um, really made me a man. I, I was able to interact with with adults that cared about me and wanted to see me win. And where if I was in a white school, I could see how I would have been either arrested or kicked out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was my first time in a black institution, uh, black in a white neighborhood. I went to white schools for the most part, uh, predominantly white schools. I went to uh, a magnet school for middle school. So I was in like around diverse crowd, but still predominantly white. Went to an all Latinx high school in eighth grade in high school and I kicked out of my middle school. And, um, and then, to go to an HBCU where I could just be black and just be like a nerd, but like think I was a, I thought I was cool, but I was a nerd. Uh, like, but but <laughs> that's Lively still girl. yeah, but that's still black enough. You know what I mean? Like it was just right. it was a dope experience, and like and it was a lot of grace that was given to me by public safety officers, or lunch ladies, or people in financial aid, or professors, like RAs, like people. It's really a community. Um, and then I didn't do didn't know what to do. That scholarship allowed me to go to my, uh, get my master's for free as well. Had I known I would have paid for, had I known I wanted to be an educator, I'd have paid for Lincoln out of pocket and went straight to grad school. Um, Cause you get five years to use a scholarship. So my fifth oh, year, man. I was talking to my, one of my uh, professors, talking to one of my old heads and everyone kept saying, go, just go get your master's, go get your master's. I'm like, I don't like school. I don't want to go get my master's. <laughs> uh, I did now, it, I did it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, let's go back a little bit. What, what was your major at Cheney? It was uh, mass communication. So it was education. No, it was education when I first got in there. Um, I thought it was a safe route, good, good route. Like I, I, I love teaching. I thought I loved teaching. I was kicked out of school. I got suspended when I was a junior in high school. And I saw this movie called Accepted. When I saw the movie Accepted, mm -hmm. it was about these kids that created their own college. I told my grandma, Cheryl Morris, who um, transitioned, I told her I wanted to be, a, uh, I went to own my own school. She said, if you want to own your own school, first you should be a teacher, then a principal, da, da, da. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I went to school for education. Um, I had found out that a child that I thought was mine was not mine after ultrasound, baby shower, first birth, not first birthday, first Christmas, we lived together, all of that. Child wasn't mine. I found that out January 21st. You're how old so, at this time? I was 19 when she got pregnant. We moved in when I was 19. I found out when I was 20 that he wasn't mine. So I changed majors that Monday. I found out on a Friday, changed majors Monday to communications because mm -hmm. I had since been uh, volunteering on this uh, this web show called pick six pick six time.com may still be around. I don't know. It's probably still on YouTube, but um, camera quality was trash. 
But um, but I started, you know, working with cameras and hosts and stuff and being on people's radio shows as a guest. So I was like, that's what I want to do. Like I want to do TV, radio, performance stuff. I want to do that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Chase Majors my senior year or well, junior year. And then um, um, that's that summer I took 13 credits. And my senior year, I took uh, 42 credits and did five internships and pledged my fraternity and still kept my scholarship somehow. So um, it was, it was a lot going on. I was like president of my class. It was so much going on, but I was just like, I got to get out of here. And I got out and I didn't keep that same energy for grad school. I'm glad I didn't because I probably would have went to school for like business or something else. Um, And my fifth year, I chose Lincoln University, stayed at HBCU. Um, I did the entire program in nine months. I decided I'm going to just go every day. People like you. My 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 advisor, you can't do this. I'm like, watch me. <laughs> he said it's it's unrealistic. You have a job. You have. I had to quit, just quit my day job in 2016. So 20. This was what 2017, 2018 school year. Um, I was. I could do whatever. Like I have. Like long as I had a venue. I remember time. this time. It's crazy. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> so I, I had a venue. I was hosting events. I was selling T-shirts left and right. Like I did Uber around the clock. I did whatever I had to do for the money on my own time, which allowed me to go to school. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday from um, from 5.30 to 8.45. And then some days I would leave at 8.45 to go host my open mic from 9 to 1. So, mm-hmm. but I made it happen. And then during that time, I started the nonprofit, the Eco Foundation. My professor said, why don't you just start a nonprofit? He saw me bagging up wristbands and buttons in between class, falling asleep, coming from an after school program, after teaching all day, like at two different schools. And, and I, I just, you, you got to piece it together sometimes. You, sometimes right. you really got to piece things together to, to make ends meet. Like, and then at that point, you know, you do what you got to do. So I started the nonprofit, but that's what ultimately what led me to uh, right. getting, my doc, getting my doctorate right now. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. So and you're, you're working on your PhD right now. My EDD. So it's an uh, educational uh, doctorate of, no, okay. doctorate of educational yeah, leadership at right. Temple. I'm working on my dissertation. So I'll be done next May. Oh, wow. That's amazing. How old are you? Like, uh, I'll be 31 in like next week. Okay. Next Shout out to Kansas in the house. Gang, gang. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> dang, that's crazy. All right. So, so many questions. Real quick, I know the Eco Foundation is raising money right now. Can you talk about that before we move forward? I don't want to miss that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I appreciate you, brother. It's, um, so Eco stands for Education, Culture, and Opportunities. And when I left my day job, I realized it didn't matter. I was a uh, went from like a teacher to a dean to a site coordinator, site coordinator to um, to assistant principal. And I thought by moving up, you can make a change. It doesn't matter how much power you get within a corrupt system. I love the school and I love my, my like one of my, my old principals, she's my, my, on my board of directors right now. So shout out to her. But we still had so many kids getting locked up, getting killed, staying out the way and not living up to potential. So I'm like, what are things that we all need no matter what? Education in an informal sense and formal sense. Culture, we need to be able to connect with each other because we're both black, but you're not from Philly. And if I step out of Philly, I need to be able to connect with them and then bridge the gap between Africans and African-Americans, anyone else in the diaspora. And then um, and then opportunities. Sometimes it's, I need to get paid under the table. Sometimes I need this internship. Sometimes I need a, uh, a broomstick. Sometimes I need a hammer. Sometimes I need whatever it is. Right. Um, that's what we do. So we opened up a community center August 16th of last year after um, spending the summer giving out food and having our summer camp for our third year in a row. And... Um, now we got a, a, a agreement of sales from our landlord. He's willing to sell us the building at eighty thousand dollars off. Mm, it's only four hundred fifty thousand wow. dollars, which means the down payment is ninety thousand dollars. We want to raise a hundred thousand just to be safe. So we're calling it the hundred K hundred day campaign. Uh, we've only raised like two thousand so far. Uh, I'm not saying only because only takes away from what we were able to do. But we have our fundraisers and things coming up. So Juneteenth is like the big kickoff of one of our first event, first large events. We have the big old kids party. Uh, July 3rd, we have another one in DC, July 24th with your homie Kristoff. Um, we have another big old kids party, August 20th, a Black to School edition. So those are our larger events to help us raise money. Um, but we anticipate by our one year anniversary, we'll have the $100,000 we need to secure our building. Okay. So we can do this work for generations to come because when I had that event space, when I quit my day job, I had to move back into my mom's house because I couldn't go to school five days a week and still do everything else I was doing because when they when they sold our building, I didn't have a way to make $500 real quick, $200 real quick, $150 real quick. You have a venue, people always need stuff. This is Philly, right. you know what I mean? And it was on 8th and Callahill. It had free parking, like every, everything you could imagine. We had it. And then when they sold our building, I felt like, like my world was crashing. 
And I'm like, I was a year out of quitting my day job. Like, should I go back? Should I go work for somebody else? Like, so, so the way that taught me, um, that taught me the importance of ownership. And I don't want anything to happen with he sells the building to someone else. They kick out us. We have four apartments up. Was four apartments upstairs and another business next to us. So we get all of these six units for three um, for four fifty. You know what I mean? So we already have three apartments upstairs where young people live in exchange for 15 hours a week. We have one sister that just moved up here from Georgia, another sister whose housing got canceled due to COVID. We have another brother who, um, he was just, you know, he had un unstable housing, like living with an aunt here, homie there or whatever. So to be able to provide young people with housing and connect them to their purpose and they teach classes that they care about while helping us distribute 20 to 40,000 pounds of food a week while also looking out for young people and paying kids as young as 10 through a paid internship. Like that's what we're doing. That's what the work we're about. And this summer, we're having four summer programs for the first time. We've always had one. Uh, so it's just, we're growing exponentially and we need all the support we can get. So the 100 Day 100K campaign is what it's all about because we want to, we want those young boys that we're serving now, we want their grandkids to see what they've built. Man, that's dope. Wow. So let's say I'm come, I come into the space. On, let's say I spend a week at the space. What am I going to be seeing in Eco Foundation? Whoa. Um, so even let's say you went during the school year or if you went uh, in the summertime, because okay. um, either way, it's the same similar vibe. So we have a music production class. We have sign language class. Um, we have this other life skills class, which teaches you how to like it's literacy, but it's like how to read body language, how to read street maps, how to put together puzzles and critically think. Um, you'd be surprised how many young people don't know how to read an analog clock, you know, with the hands on. Right. You know, yeah. so we teach them that kind of stuff um as well as we have dance we have uh photography and video production we have interior design uh we have oh self-defense we had jiu-jitsu for a six-week time period but what's been more consistent is um is muay thai they both incorporate boxing so that's good muay thai is more hands knees and stuff like that uh jiu-jitsu was more like what happens when you're on the ground how do you leverage your size or your opponent's size against them um so yeah, it's all about liberating people. So you'll be, you you spend a week with us, you'll you'll learn. Uh, we'll plant the seeds for you to be free, or we'll water whatever seeds have already been planted. You gotta learn how to defend yourself in your community. You gotta know how to uh, count your money, how to um, survive in the cold. Starting a, a branding class, like a social media branding class with us. So um, you gotta learn how to take whatever your product is and, and sell it. We have a jewelry making coming up with a sister who made my my necklace. Shout out to Earthing Wear. Um, yeah, and we and we oh, and then we have a uh, Teen Talk Tuesday, which happens once a month. We have Man Crown Monday once a month, Women Crown Wednesday once a month, and there's this uh, LGBT plus um, event. I don't know what it's called. I think it's like Royal TV. Like I think that's the name we set it on uh, right. once a month as well. And those are support groups. And we have another event um, with Kayla Sari. She just got her um, her degree in mental health, whatever it's called. When you're a therapist, uh, which we'll be doing like an art therapy kickback type situation. So people can come in and sign up for one on one 30 minute sessions to get free art therapy, or they could do a group therapy as a session as a group as well. So, um, yeah, that's crazy. So you're like definitely probably the busiest person I know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it is not should. like I no, it, it's people that's like busy that's always like they might just be doing stuff it could be vacation it could be whatever but I feel like you're busy in a way of like always being productive right there's always mm -hmm. a giving to uh people around you um mm -hmm. and kind of serving the community I feel like that's always happening and if not it's like whatever you're doing for yourself is to better yourself um so can I, can I just jump in real quick bro? Yeah. just let you know it's because I have a team um, prior to 2019, I didn't have a team. So mm -hmm. doing all this stuff on my own, I can only stretch myself with so thin and waters down your work and, and then it, it, it weakens your word and you're not able to keep your word the way you said you would. So having a strong team around me that are also intentional about doing this, what it's about. As a conductor, I don't have to know how to play every instrument in the orchestra, but I know how to make it shake and they could do the work. How, I'm how not, did you build this team though? How did you go about building a team? Uh, it's over time. There, there really is no cheat sheet to it. Like there's certain things that, that are divinely aligned. Like the sister Kayla Sari, I met her when I was the after school coordinator at a, a school in West Philly. She was in mural arts. We stayed connected. I hired her to do a contract with uh, Gerard College. Then I hired her for a summer camp. Then I hired her for a contract with Cheney. Um, but going back to it, like working with Cheney, like I'm connected to like interns and stuff. And and then my homie Oba Sankofa, I just bumped into him at an open mic a couple of times. And then he came up to one of my events and said, yo, I'm teaching math and reading using hip hop and poetry. Mm -hmm. Are you down? And I'm like, yeah. And then I saw what education could look like. And I realized like, yo, we don't, 
this entertainment thing, that's my dissertation is on this entertainment thing, like this is what it's about, someone who educates and entertains. So I cannot find people who have the skills I don't have. My homegirls, my my family, my friends, like people say you can't work with family and friends. All I work with is family and friends. Right. And it's just putting systems in place so either they don't necessarily have to report to me or there's so many checks and balances and there's other people holding each other accountable that it doesn't have to, the hammer doesn't have to come down on anybody. You know what I mean? Because that can, that can muddy the waters as well. Right. It's my team. It's my team. Now, you mentioned some things being divine. Like, what are some of your spiritual practices? And um, as I asked that, I want, yeah, so I, I, I have two questions at once. On one side, I want to know your spiritual practices, but also I kind of want to know about what happened in 2013. I know one thing we talked about just um, before, like, you know, some years back was like what was pushing you was that, you know, being shot six times and like kind of coming back to life and what that was like. So, yeah, all of that is the same question. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, honestly, it's uh, my mom's always praying for me. You know, my mom's always praying for me for little things from me getting a parking spot in front of her house to getting home safely or whatever. So I honestly believe that my prayers, my mom's prayers and the prayers of my ancestors that are doing the, the spiritual work behind enemy lines and constantly surrounding me. Um, it's the people like my bloodline that are physically here and those that are transcendent. My grandma Cheryl, I know for a fact, Cheryl, like making sure like them checks come through when they come. My grandma was very about the money and very about uh, joy and laughter, right? And God, the creator is, uh, has kept me here for a reason, going back to the shooting. Um, it's been eight years now, eight years, eight and a half years. Um, I was shot six times. My homie didn't make it. He was shot twice. Uh, my other homie was shot in the bottom of the foot and he's doing really well. I'm actually going to his birthday party tomorrow. My other sister jumped out the window. I don't know what happened to her. Um, I know she broke her legs and she came to that first court date and then she didn't really come by after that. But um, but that night, uh, uh, my heart stopped. I died on the table briefly. Um, and in the temple's emergency room, there's a curtain that separates the two uh, the two beds. He died on the table next to me. You know what I mean? Wow. I, and I died, but I came back. So there's a reason why I'm still here, whatever that may be. Um, and in the beginning, it was like survivor's guilt. It was um. It was a lot of uh, self-medicating, a lot of like sex, drugs, and alcohol, and just things to numb out. And I realized that you had to feel to heal. And through that, I started, when I met my partner, uh, she got me going to therapy. She was like, I'm your friend. This is when we were still friends. So I'm your friend. Um, I'm not a professional. And it's not fair to us to put this on us and expect a, a major change. And, and we should have to deal with like the collateral damage of you healing. And I was just like, okay. And I was like, I think I love this girl. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, she got me going to therapy and processing things and like daddy issues and mommy issues and me issues and identity issues and all these yeah. issues get the tissues, you know, you, you know. But. Yeah, cause, I mean, you're not sitting like, oh, I have all these problems. You kind of, you know, people just feel normal, right? You just feel like, mm -hmm. all right, whatever, life, like some things happen sometimes, but I'm, you know, I'm normal. I'm good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's kind of like, and I think that was the thing, like I normalized, uh, like the child not being mine, like that that messed up a lot of relationships for years to come and like trust issues with women. Um, he had my name for God's sake. Like I almost had his name tatted on me. You know what I mean? Like it was glad I had the money that day. That'd have been awkward. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, but like, you, you know, you have those types of things or like my grandma was my best friend. I think we all lost someone at this point in our lives. Um, like those are types of things that, that and shooting, I just kind of normalize all of this oh, stuff happens, you know, it is what it is. And, um, but that's not the case, right? Like, but we were so numb to violence. And I didn't grow up in a violent community. I grew up in Roxborough, really mm, white neighborhood, okay. in the, especially in the 90s. I visited them, my cousins and so forth. My schools may have been in those neighborhoods, but I didn't experience that. So um, to have never lost anyone to, to gun violence. Um, and then all of a sudden, and you know the thing is in this building, it's always the neighbors. Like they never, they're always ringing the wrong doorbell. Oh, uh, right. like people, like they, it's never for it's never for us. Um, yeah. But I've learned to I've learned to normalize these things, and um, and and they shouldn't be normalized. But just sweep them under the rug and keep it moving because the work got to get done. And now that I'm healing, I know that a part of my self care is taking a trip or taking a couple of days off. I don't necessarily have to physically go somewhere, even though during COVID that was my thing. But now it's just like. I need to have a few days where no one's talking to me about nothing. And, it's, and I know I can bust my behind and work a 50, 60, 70 hour work week, two, three weeks in a row, as long as I get that four to five days off where no one's bothering me. And I can still have a couple of days while I work independently and don't respond to my emails, but 
that's a lot of decision making. But like I said, I have a team now. We got a grant and uh, we hired two people uh, part time, 20 hours each a week. And we still have my um, our chief operating officer. She goes by the name Dreamworker. Um, and, and she still does her part 30 hours a week. And um, and I have my day, my teachers that are in the, in the trenches and my teachers who are now off of school. They're putting in more work. So it, help, it helps with the, it helps carry the load. Once again, I got to keep mentioning my team because it's about the team. Now, what does relaxation look like for you, right? What does that mean? Uh, I would say, honestly, man, I like to binge watch stuff when I can binge watch stuff. Like if I can get a couple episodes and I say binge watch, I mean finish a, a one hour show and then maybe okay. watch a second. I don't mean like three, four or five because I don't usually have that time. But what's, what's one of your favorite shows or something you watched recently? Something I watch, I watch all the superhero stuff. So like I just discovered Marvel um when i was watching the falcon and winter soldier so then i went back and watched everything to add context and then mm-hmm. contact context and then i was able to watch like the wandavision show and now i'm watching loki but in between that when i needed my fix like i need my superhero fix excuse me i was watching um the boys i was watching invincible i was watching uh jupiter's legacy um right now i'm watching la's finest season two just came out so I'm yeah to, watching I'm that to round two yeah yeah i'm about, I'm about yeah. yeah i'm about to start that so that's the kind of stuff I do. Um, honestly, just spending time with friends and family. My couple's therapist told me, um, shout out to Tommy the model. He connected me with his couple's therapist. And um, uh, she told me that sometimes the best therapy isn't sitting on someone's couch, um, or sitting on a therapist's couch, or sitting on a friend's couch or, or a parent, family's couch. Mm-hmm. And just spending that time with your friends and family really will rejuvenate you and give you the energy you need. So like this backyard, last minute birthday kickback I'm going to tomorrow night, like, that's, I look forward to that. So it's like, I know today I have seven meetings back to back. Tomorrow I have six meetings back to back, but then it's his birthday and I get to celebrate his life. Like he's still with us. You know what I mean? His blood cousin, my homie is not with us, but we all go and celebrate together. But the next day, my mom's in surgery. She uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer in June. I'm sorry, January. I moved back in her house in February. And um, that's been an interesting transition, but I know that she's going to be off her feet for a couple of weeks. And luckily my sister's home from school now and that she just graduated as a nurse. So that's even easier, you know, with like helping out with that kind of stuff. But I know I'm gonna spend all day Thursday, like on my family time. And then Friday is getting ready because Saturday, Juneteenth is fun for a lot of people, but it's work for us, you know? So uh, we got a March that I'm doing. And then we got this big event we're doing at the Eco Center with pop-up therapy and food distribution, and hot meal distribution and vendors and performances. and. I can't wait till five o'clock on. I can't wait to know six o'clock on Juneteenth when my <laughs> my day can my night can start. You know, so go sit down somewhere. Now yeah, like, for a couple of days. I got like two questions for you. Yeah, um, for sure. One, like I want to hear more about your grandmother. Like, where is she from? Like, what do you remember? Like, what's the story you remember most when you think about your grandmother? Uh, so she's from Florida, down in like Saint Petersburg, that area. Um, but Cheryl Morris spent a lot of her time in Philly. Um, like, like she grew up in Philly, went to graduate from high school in Philly and she had my dad at like 17, uh, her and my grandpa only a couple years apart, which is uh, apparently a lot less common when you look at like our elders and like the, the age, the gap between the men and the women. Um, but either way I had my pop and, um, my grandma, my but great grandma older than your grandfather. No, she was uh, like a year younger or like yeah, yeah. around the same age. Cause like a lot of time when I talk to elders, it's like, oh, they were 17, he was 22 or it was like a, right. just a large, a larger gap. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, so that was cool. Um, she raised, she raised my grand, she raised my, my pop with the help of my great grandmother. Um, she loved Jean Tate after Splash until she had pneumonia and then the smell started to bother her of all colognes and perfumes and all of that mm. uh me smelling like outside was probably the only thing she could st- she could stomach she would always give up her uh, her bed for me when i come over she'd sleep on the couch um she'd make me chocolate milk after school with uh with butter with toast like toast with butter just like regular room temperature butter on toast after school okay. and chocolate milk hit the spot but my favorite memory is probably like I lost my virginity and she was the first person I told I was visiting her in the hospital <laughs> <laughs> and I was like oh grandma yo it's this thing I discovered it's lit <laughs> like, oh my god and then she was like so I guess you're not uh dating Miss Pamela anymore I'm like Miss Pamela what are you talking about she said think about it Miss Pamela and I was like grandma you're a nut bro like macadamia oh <laughs> she so um and like I crashed her car when I was 14 like I'm supposed to just be 
turn. I was supposed to be putting the windows down. I put it in gear, hopped the curb, and crashed it. Like, oh my absolutely. Like, my grandma was my man. So that was my ride or die. Though. So, uh, yeah, shout out to Cheryl, Cheryl Ernestine Morris. Or, you know, I've been doing a lot of family tree research, and like, I just love hearing, I just love hearing about the grandparents, the great grandparents, and all of that. Mm. And uh, mm-hmm. we, um, you know, they they pass away. They often pass away in our late teens, early twenties, and we, in a lot of ways, end up doing the work they would have done. Mm. They would have been doing. But yeah. So my last question is, uh, what is a uh, out of everything you've done so far? One is what is one of the things you're most proudest of uh, as far as any accomplishment that could be life in general, that could be career. Uh, yeah. That's a great question. Honestly, I don't think I'm. It's tough. I don't think I'm really most proud of anything at this point. Um, and that goes back to like a lot of times when we do this work, we're never satisfied. And I think that constant hunger or thirst or whichever one it is, what keeps me going to do more um, because like I finally got a salary this year. You know, like I finally have like consistent money from something that I built. And now my goal is to get the people around me salaries. Everyone needs to know what this feels like. Um, so until that happens, the community center is great, feeding 5,000 families so far this year, employing like all the data and the numbers is fine. You know what I mean? But um, but I, we're not there yet. We don't own that building. We don't own that block. We don't have a, a, a team of people that are working. I, I don't know. I think of all the things we don't have, and I don't want to approach it from that deficit yeah, well, um, I mean- or from a place of lack, but I'm just not, I'm just not like, honestly, like, I just haven't found it yet. I would say That's living in my... Pro- what do you want to see then? Tell me what you want to see. Like, what does that look like? Bro, like, we got to change this whole racket, this whole racket of education. Like, we children need rights. So getting children rights is, is Black children rights is the thing I'm most passionate about. And changing what education looks like uh, so that everyone has to, like, learn how to culturally teach and instruct and support young people. Um reallocating funds, defunding the police. Like, it's just so many things that I, I want to see that that we think it requires a superhero to come and save us to do, but it's not. Like, we are the Justice League. Like, we are the people that are going to come and make this change. And and for me, that's what it is. Getting people to recognize their power and, and step into it and transform into their best selves, into their, into their I uh, can't just say the, the last name, into their Johnny Williamses and and into their Kyle the Conductors. Like, that's, that's, that's what we need to see happen. You know what I mean? Because... Like Clark Kent was Superman the whole time. He just didn't know it. You know what I'm saying? So like, how do we, how do we get everyone else to see this? Because if everyone else was doing what I was doing in their own way, then we would have a much better, safer place. So that's my goal is just to awaken this in other people and to ignite this in other people. And, and like I said, conduct myself and those around me so we can get our people to freedom. And I feel like in, as, as Fannie Lou Hamer said, we ain't free till we are free. So it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Like this other stuff is cool, but this is small things and like I know what we're gonna be doing. And listen to William still do this from 30 to 45 years old. Um, I put it in my phone because I wrote it down. I realized you don't know what I'm pointing at. Um, <laughs> but doing this from <laughs> doing this from 30 to 45, I, just, I was just talking to a, a, a brother that works with me with the Black Brotherly Love Leadership Coalition Council. I mean, and um, he said we're gonna be doing this work 10 to 15 years. So really, mm-hmm. we don't have to. We don't have to rush. Like we don't have to feel like we have to go for everything. Like, we don't have the time. Or we don't have the energy. We don't have. It doesn't have to be right now. And that gives me peace and also lets me know like I have about 10 to 15 years of working in me and I'm retired. Like, I know I'm leaving my position at ECO in five to six, seven more years. And then that'd be my, I did my 10 years and I pass it on to the next person. No one should be in leadership for too long. Wow. Um, maybe as an advisor, I'll come back around. But my next goal is we're starting a university of our own. There's no reason we can't get this funding and have people come to our university where their core curriculum class, their associate's degree is how to do anything related to financial literacy, how to love yourself, how to communicate, mandatory therapy, and not just Western therapy. Like we have our own versions of therapy as well, but like right. there has to be like nutrition, like all, that's that's our core, that's our university. And then they get to go into their major classes and spend another two years of focusing on, like, I wanna be the best host there ever was. I wanna be the best poet there ever was. And their teachers are you and me and the next person. And think about how dope it would be if, if we were the professors getting 75, 80K a year and students didn't have to come take out loans at 17, 18, 19, 20, because they want they want to do more. Like, no, it should be free to them and subsidized by the, or paid for by the government, or they should have to pay into it and, and work it off. Like, okay, and you may owe, and I don't mean indentured servitude, I mean, you may owe a total of 
a thousand dollars a semester. And over the course of this thousand, uh, this semester, you spend 16 weeks doing community service and that equals a thousand dollars that you, you've earned your keep. Like just showing people the importance of accountability. And that's the goal that I'm, that's what I'm wanna start. That's what I'm going to be doing from 35 to 40. And by 40, I want that university to be up and running. And by 45, I need to wash my hands on all of this and just, just go speak and teach as I feel like it. That's, that's what freedom is to me. Starting my family in like five, six, seven years. Um, how old is my lady? I don't know, like five, six years, something like that. <laughs> and just, you know, whatever, time, whatever time is divine, you know what I mean? Right. It's just like, that's, that's freedom. I want to raise my children. I like how Dame Dad said he could take his kids to school. That's freedom. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, that's, that's right. what I want. I love my pop. I love the things he's done for me, but not having the energy to be a father when I needed him was important. Like, cause he was always working or writing something or hosting something. And then my siblings were born and he got a second job at Southwest Airlines. And like, he's just always been working that he didn't have the time to really be there the way I needed him to be there for me. And as I watched the show, Jupiter's Legacy, you see a common theme where you have the superhero who's superhero to everyone else, but at home, he's not giving the attention to his children that he needs. And I, and I, I, I don't want to be, my, my kids, every kid is going to have something to say about their parents, but they ain't going to be able to say that I wasn't there and I wasn't there for them and I wasn't at practices and recitals and all of that. So I'm, I'm doing this work for my great grandkids. And I think that's the evolution. Like we've seen, I'm a big, you know, student of Malcolm X, but then I go like, well, all those things he did for us as a community, but his, his kids suffered because of it. They got less time with him. And so I think that's the evolution to do community work or whatever career path, passion path you want but make sure when those kids come along, like they have you whenever they need to, you know what I mean? Whenever they want to, right? It doesn't have to mm -hmm. be a need thing, but like, oh, like, yo, we chilling. We do this every weekend. We do this every week. Mm -hmm. You have some type of right. like rules within the home, right? Yeah. So actually my, uh, I said, this is my last question. A question I, I asked everybody and I'm gonna let you cheat a little bit. Um, so normally my question is, if you could throw a music festival with uh, any artists, any musicians, or anything from any genre, dead or alive, who would be the top three acts? Any artists that are alive. Now, the, the reason I will let you cheat is like, if you want to throw a speaker in, you can throw a speaker in to dead or alive, anybody just like, <laughs> yeah. So top three, who, who's, who, who's at, your, at, at, the, at the call to conduct the festival? All right, so, so, I think it's important to get people, I think about the flow of energy at an event, right? Mm -hmm. And ah, as much as I, my favorite artist is Drake, hands down Drake. It's just Drake. It's just Drake. It's just any mood. He's just boom. Uh, never talk about killing people or not. It's just a good, you know, other problematic things, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so I think to get the people there, to draw people's attention, to get them connected to the space, I want to say Drake, but I think about how J. Cole talks in between his, his songs and like the message they'll get from that. I'm uh, talking too much. Go with Drake. Drake is the uh, opening act. Okay. Tupac is oh. the next act. <laughs> Go from Drake to Tupac. Yes, Drake to Tupac. And then the keynote speaker at the end is Fred Hampton. And he's the person, he's the call to action. He's, the, he's our call to action. He's our, he's our person. Um, and if I had to do, I'm just leave it at that. But like, if I had to like switch it up for like for this in that same vein, but I'm not as into them, but I know that they're popping like that. Beyonce's hands down probably the best entertainer of all time. So my heart, heart is working at the very least. So she would be my Drake and that, like, she'd be my opener. And then my second person would be somebody that um, probably like a Biggie because people love Biggie. I'm not a Biggie fan. And then instead of Fred Hampton, probably um, Angela Davis. I love, I love her speech. Or Asada, honestly, Asada, yeah. We All must right. continue to fight for our, yeah, we must continue to fight for our freedom. We must continue. Uh, we, okay. We, yeah. All right. So you did it two day. Day one, we got Drake, Tupac, Fred Hampton. On day two, we got Beyonce, Biggie, and Asada Shakur. Yep. It's a festival. That's a, that's a festival. It's a festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hey. Thank you for sharing information. Um, you all are doing a great job over there. Um, Thanks, shout man. out to you and the team. Shout out to everything you're doing and working through this during the, during the pandemic and getting some rest <laughs> for yourself too. Yeah, man. Thank you again for everything, brother. Um, I know you're recording right now. I'm going to shoot you with text. Um, but just thank you. Thank you for everything. I right, appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of the Branch Normal Collection. Hey.